Thank you so much to Culture Bridge Northeast for inviting us to be part of the programme of this brilliant conference. I think, um, as Kiz said in her opening speech, um, connection is really important at the moment and, um, and the opportunity to talk about practice, and passion and purpose and politics, maybe not today, but politics generally um, with, with um, people who are working in our sector is is certainly giving me a lot of comfort in these times. So, uh, so yeah, it's really it's really great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, the plan, as Susie outlined, is that um, I'm going to introduce in a short while my friend and colleague Sarah Argent, um, who I've collaborated with over a number of years um, on a number of early years projects, and she also has a vast practice of her own in co-creation with very young children. And we're going to be talking a little bit about our practice pre-COVID and the qualities of the practice. Um, and then uh, the project which has emerged um, in response to COVID and the things that we've learned and are still learning um, as part of that project, which is called When the Birds Sang. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Theatre Hullabaloo, um, we are a specialist producer of theatre for young audiences based down in Darlington. We've got a particular interest in creativity in early childhood um, and uh, in December 2017, we realised our dream of opening a specialist children's theatre, um, which is called the Hullabaloo. And if you go into the Hullabaloo, then you will meet somebody um, which, who will be wearing a T-shirt, um, which says uh, theatre with children at the heart. And that really is central to our belief, both that um, children have a right to art, which is as sophisticated as we know them to be but also that um, theatre and creativity, particularly in the lives of very young children, does have a real significant social impact. And so those two ideas sit side by side in the work that we make. Um, what does that mean in terms of our artistic process? Um, I think we are a producer-led organisation, so we, we create a, quite a wide range of work. And I guess the commonality in the way that we work with artists and children is the idea that all our commissions come from this idea of following the fascination. So um, we, or everything that we do is inspired by something which has a fascination for children. And um, so an example of that might be um, uh, the uh, invitation to babies to come into um, the rehearsal room from day two to make a new piece of baby theatre with us and a kind of a technical following the fascination of essentially a free play development session which enables us to better understand and immerse ourselves in the fascination of a four month old perhaps with a with a black ribbon as opposed to a green ribbon and whether that holds true for a 14 month old as well so um, I guess finding the truth, which is essentially what artists are looking for when they're making when they're making good art. Um, the other example, I guess, as you start to work with children who are more verbal, becoming beginning to develop language, beginning to develop an understanding of story and narrative, is um, is where we we start to enter the world of ideas. And again, that's very much about following the fascination. So the project which Sarah and I have worked most meaningfully on for a, a very long time, actually, it's uh, it started, it was born about eight years ago, I think now, is, is the project called Luna, which became a show for two to five year olds, but began very much with, um, with my two year old godson's fascination with the moon. Um, he was particularly tickled when the moon would appear during the day. Um, it was a bit naughty doing that, um, but generally, a fascination with with the moon and where it comes from and who it is and that initial fascination we followed we followed into development periods with nurseries right across Darlington uh, really interrogating through a mixture of child's child-led free play and um, and questions between children and other children and conversations and visual stimulus we really began to unpick um, what it was that was fascinating universally about the moon for that age range and in so doing creating a mine of, of richness I guess which informed um, the choices that were made in terms of in terms of the show that it eventually came. So a child-centered development process that involved a number of hundred children which informed a show which has now been seen by a number of thousand. And um, my friend and colleague Sarah Argent was the creative driving force behind Lena. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce her today. Um, 
at one end of the spectrum we have following the fascination, but Sarah's work in terms of co-creation with very young children has gone much further than that in terms of her engagement with actually developing stories and mining stories and, uh, and even finding the words that have come in her productions as well. So it's really lovely to see you, Sarah. And then um, it would be really interesting to start to kind of unpick some of your experiences of, of, of developing material, finding that brilliant richness of material that has informed the performance work you've made. It, it's so lovely to be here. I'm actually in Cardiff where we're in national firebreaker lockdown at the moment. Um, and so it's, it's a joy to be linking with people in the Northeast. I've had such fantastic creative and, and personal times in Darlington and Durham and Newcastle. So it's, it's lovely to be with you today. Um, could we have the next slide, Danny? This is a photo of a project called Words in the Woods, um, which was a collaboration between Theatre Yolo, which is an Arts Council of Wales funded company based here in Cardiff, who make work for children and young people. And over about 15 years up to 2018, I, I made um, or worked on all of their work for early years. And Words in the Woods was a fantastic collaboration between Theatre Yolo and I'm just going to read this title because it's quite long, the Vale of Glamorgan Forest Education Initiative Cluster Group. So it was um, advisory teacher, the Forestry Commission and many of the schools that were very committed to forest schools. And they had been excited by a previous project where I had gone into nurseries with, and I'm going to do a really low tech thing here and just hold this up, um, a suitcase of objects. I wanted to do something in the summer term. Um, at the time, all of the companies in Wales were very firmly wedded to their local education authority. And on the whole productions, professional theatre productions were made pre each term. So in the summer term, a show was out on the road, was touring, but I wasn't necessarily engaging with children because that show was being performed by actors in, in schools or nurseries. So I had read about the work of a Chicago early years practitioner, Vivian Gussin Paley, and her seminal book, The Boy Who Would Be a Helicopter. I also encountered a number of puericultrici, so nursery nurses in Bologna, in Italy. And both, both of those groups, the person and, and the nursery teachers, had really looked at how could you gather stories from children and how could you gather those stories verbatim. And I proposed to Theatre Yellow that we do a project that was a kind of mashup of their, their two methodologies, their two philosophies. And as a result, went into nurseries with that suitcase of objects and spent time with an individual child, as much time as that individual child wanted to spend with me, which I know was a huge privilege, um, and asked them to tell me a story about whichever object they were most drawn to from the suitcase of objects. And I would sit and scribe those. Um, there is a document that we haven't yet shared, but I probably can share, which gives the, the, the kind of detail of that, that scribing and that process. But it resulted in the most amazing stories um, that very much had the children's voices and concerns and passions and preoccupations woven into them. And I, th I think very much an innate understanding of story structure and a morality. Um, and we decided to share those stories at a, a twilight CPD session with educationalists. We brought in two performers and a musician um, to present those stories rather than just read them out. And what was fascinating was during the sharing of the rehearsal of the sharing, suddenly these performers who had never met the children were embodying the children's energies, their rhythms, their body language, their characters. And I, I interrogated this and said, how is this possible? You haven't met these children. 
And they said their voices and their characters and their energy are so woven into the words that they've written, the choices they've made. Um, so when we then presented it to the teachers and there was this fantastic kind of visceral response from them to the children's words, the staff of Theatre Yellow started to look at one another and sense there was something really exciting going on. And afterwards we said, what about if rather than simply using the images that the children have created, which was our initial idea for the production that was going to develop from their stories about the suitcase objects, we use their words absolutely verbatim. So there isn't a single word that is spoken by the professional actors within the piece that hasn't come directly from the mouths and the imaginations of the children. And we, we, we hedged our bets very slightly. We said we aimed to, and we're absolutely thrilled that that is exactly what we managed to do. Um, and it was a show that, that ended up being hugely successful and has been to South Korea and the Czech Republic. Um, I think one of my proudest professional moments was a little boy in Seoul, literally falling off his chair repeatedly at a story told to me by Charlie Joe, who was an elective mute in a, a nursery in, in Barry. I don't know if any of you watch Gavin and Stacey, but it's where, it's where um, Gavin and Stacey is set. Charlie Joe had finally told me a story and had spoken about a one-footed baby and about how the baby's mum had gone to the baby shop to buy a new foot for her baby. Um, and the shopkeeper said, I'm sorry, we don't have any baby feet today. And the mum said, that's all right, I'll come back another day. <laughs> um, and this, the full story, this little boy falling off his seat in response to Charlie Joe in Barry's story, inspired by a baby shoe in a suitcase. Um, so we decided this was a fantastic methodology. We, the children's response to the work that had come entirely from their peers, imaginations and, and vocabularies was incredible. That There was again, a kind of rapt attention, a joy at the quirkiness, the poeticism, the surrealism of the, the other children's stories that really resonated. Adults who knew children were saying, I mean, there was a beautiful quote from Dylan's mum, it was just like being inside the head of my three-year-old. Um, and I think somehow using the children's words for beta managed to touch the other children more profoundly perhaps than, than our own adult creations for children. Um, so the next project of the, the words in the woods that you saw the beautiful picture of the little girl in, in the forest, um, the Vale of Glamorgan Forest Education Initiative Cluster Group came to us and said, could we do a similar project, but rather than the children creating stories in response to objects, could we take them on an adventure? So we took them into a forest where they encountered giant pencils hanging from the trees. They encountered um, two characters. So somebody with wings who lived in the forest. She had a teddy bear called Tuesday because Tuesday was the first day she'd found him. She had a cooking pot. She invited the children to gather feathers and, and stones and pine cones to add to her cooking pot to make magic soup. They encountered Jack up in a tree who took them on a journey to the pond to um, help him sail his boat Friday, who had first set sail on a Friday. Um, and he told them that Friday had once sailed across the sea to a magical land. So they experienced all of this and ran around marvelling at pencils and ribbons and gathering pine cones. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd ever been into a forest. So that was a... They'd been in the forest school, but the scale and scope of the actual forest was, was so exciting to them. Um, and we then invited them both to tell us in their own words what they had experienced um, and to then go on two imaginative flights of fancy. So what would happen to you if you ate magic soup? You might be yellow. You might be invisible and you could creep around and nobody could see you. 
Um, and we also asked them to tell us where they imagined Friday might have sailed away to. And they talked about the land of sand. They talked about um, lands of dragons. That They were Welsh children, of course, they'd mentioned dragons. Um, and again, we collated that material and turned it into a professional production that then toured two nursery settings, um, which was called Finding Leaves for Soup. The picture of the gingerbread man is the third production we did where we took objects that we knew were linked to known fairy tales. But because of the diversity of the children with whom we were working, one of the one of the nurseries, I think there were 26 languages spoken by the children within that nursery. They're from different cultures, different cultural contexts. We found objects that related to folk tales in different cultural contexts um, and didn't impose those on the children. So for example, those that knew the gingerbread man's story might retell it. Somebody else might say it was a biscuit that they'd, they'd eaten once. The next slide of the, the sparkly silver shoe Some of the children would tell us about Cinderella because that was a story they knew. Others would tell us about there was a sparkly, sparkly shoe. Um, and so in all of that work, what we were very, very clear not to do, even with the characters they encountered in, in the forest, was to impose on them a narrative or um, a characterization. There was no reference to a fairy in the woods. She was wearing wings, but they were free to decide who she was. Um, and so it was very much putting their imaginations, thoughts, concerns, passions, you know, as, as Miranda said earlier, at the heart of the work. And we ended up with pieces that absolutely resonated for them and their peers. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, and also made extremely good pieces of theatre, which I think in all, in all cases. Um, so I think there was a real challenge for us, wasn't there? It just um, by giving you those little tasters of, of, of our artistic process in, in normal times, I think COVID-19 presented real challenges for us. And in, in the first instance, um, obviously I think we both had a concern about um, the rush to put live performance for very young children on, on screen. Um, I think the qualities that make really good um, theatre and live performance for very young children are not transferable to screen. Um, and I think that was a real challenge, wasn't it? Because a lot of theatre makers did do that, Sarah. And I know you had some similar concerns to me about the, the necessity to further reimagine, I think, in order to serve young children well. Um, if we weren't able to meet in the real, because that's really the essence of, of, of all we've described in terms of the engagement with the children. It's about being with them, being with them, listening to them, <laughs> being in conversation with them, um, offer, making them offers and, and receiving things in return. And that's what, what gives us this big um, mine of, of fantastic material to use. And I think as, as, as we talked about before, their voices in the normal process are unmediated. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously at this period in time, we were having to target them through their families, which created a challenge in terms of the voices being mediated. But I think as we also felt, um, and I'll maybe pass back to you for that, Miranda, there was a real advantage in some respects for the parents of having an outlet to be able to share their familial concerns during this time. Yeah, I, I think that was that's what prompted us to to move into um, when the birds sang um, as an idea. Uh, I think I think we all felt acutely at Theatre Hullabaloo that people were really reaching out to us um, at a point where um, you know there were a huge it was, you know people were on a huge emotional roller coaster in what we'll refer to as lockdown hashtag one probably now and <laughs> um, uh, we, we we had a huge and we're still getting a, a huge number of social media messages with people wanting to tell us about the experiences that they're having with their children during this period and um, with the intensity of the experience and with with the way that their children are, are responding to to this extraordinary time in everybody's lives 
And um, so we felt a responsibility to offer in the first instance, uh, just a space to, to tell us about those things. Um, partly because we felt, we felt, as I said, the, that our communities, our families were wanting to communicate that to us. And partly as well as artists, I think it's, um, it's undeniable that this is a, an extraordinary time in everybody's lives. It's, it's undeniable that it's, it's an extraordinary time and a formative time for, for lots of families and lots of children, particularly in their, the first years of their lives. Um, and, but it's very difficult at this particular stage when we're still so immersed in it to make any meaning of it. So we also recognized that, um, that it was about a capture, a capture of a moment in time of the, of the themes and ideas that people, people were sharing with us. So Danny, if you want to move to the next slide, I think, we will. We created a very simple, what we call what we called an ideas catcher, and the invitation to um, two families was to share with us and um, the thoughts, the ideas, the conversations, the images. It was it was very very open, wasn't it, Sarah? The invitation to tell us what was happening in in their family lives during lockdown, and uh, and we tried to offer them. Um, a, a creative stimulus, I guess, to start to uh, start to promote some of the, um, the 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 material that would be of real value to us in an artistic process. And Sarah penned a, a very lovely poem, which I think she's going to read you now from the next slide. If we can move on, please. When the birds sang, it was a time when the birds sang loudly and more sweetly. A time when the trees blossomed, a time when the sun shone and only a few aeroplanes flew across blue skies. A time when people stayed home. Some played games together, some read stories together, some danced and sang together. It was a time when people laughed together, but were sometimes sad or sometimes a little bit afraid. It was a strange but a beautiful time when the birds sang. That, that's actually made me quite sad because I'm thinking second second lockdown I think is going to be a little bit harder <laughs> because maybe not so not so much blossom not so many blue skies and maybe not so many birds but we'll get through it <laughs> these these images were the ones that were being fed to us so the so the title of when the birds sang came from a, a conversation um that I had with a programmer actually who said she just spoken to her niece in London and asked how she was and she said it's okay I'm not going to school but the birds are singing really loudly and there were a lot of observations that children were making and that parents were feeding back to parents and carers were feeding back to us about, um, about things like the birds just seeming to sing much louder um, about the absence of cars on the, on the streets um, and particularly children in urban um, contexts as well, just being feeling like they were much more in touch with the natural world. And again, that might've been to do with the seasons, as I say, um, but yeah, so the images that you, you composed into that um, creative stimulus for a response, I think were very much the ones that were being fed to us in those early days before we actually made a formal invitation. Um, yeah. Is there anything else to say? Because we did, we did um, agonize for a while about whether to, to offer something to people, whether it was too leading really, wasn't it? Very, very aware that we were speaking directly to the adults and children's lives rather than the children themselves. I think as well, I mean, it's really interesting. There was a, a session in South Africa this morning, the, the joy of, of lockdown that I could come straight from Johannesburg to here. Um, but again, I, I suppose one of the issues was to what extent did we focus on the positive and to what extent did we acknowledge that not everybody was at home playing games and reading stories and dancing and singing together. You know, we're, we're aware of digital poverty. We're aware that some homes are chaotic, are loud, violent, hungry, thirsty. Um, and I, I think certainly in, in one of the reasons Miranda and I really enjoy collaborating is that in the work that we make, we don't shy away from that that we are, we are acutely aware that children have a, a really complex emotional range um, and that three and four year olds experience loss, fear, anger, jealousy in exactly the same way, although possibly in response to different triggers as adults do. Um, but it was a, 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 in creating the poem, it was feeling 
particularly at that time, to focus on some of some of the positives while alluding to the challenges was really, really important. Um, and, and we got a very sort of broad response, didn't we? A lot of people continued mm -hmm. to feed us ideas and thoughts through social media, sometimes explicitly because they wanted us to know about the conversations they were having with their children because they wanted us to make a piece of work that they could come and see at the Hullabaloo, which was, was really interesting that there's obviously that connection with the way that we make work and the, the recognition that this was an important marker, an important point in time that everybody was feeling these really strong emotional responses. Um, but also, um, David, do you want to skip to the next slide for me, please? Um, a very unusual in terms of our usual practice because um, the, the, the feedback that we were getting, the artistic responses that we were getting to our invitation were very much mediated by adults and yeah, so Margaret, do you want to have a talk about Margot particularly, Sarah? Um, I, I did marvel at Margot um, that she's possibly an infant prodigy, that at age one, the colours of the rainbow were as reflective of a, of a real rainbow as they are in this picture. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but one senses there might have been some parental involvement in this. Um, and that's not criticizing the parent in any shape or form. It was obviously a, a very strong need, but it did mean that the material we were gathering was slightly different to um, the unmediated responses that we, we would usually try and focus on. Um, I think, I mean, the, the rainbow has been a really potent image for, for so many, or, or certainly was in, in, in lockdown one. Um, but it would be fascinating. It, it's an adult construct. It's not necessarily how children have responded to the situation. They've, they've embraced it. They've enjoyed, you know, as I walk around Cardiff, or certainly still now, many of the windows have rainbows in the window. Um, but an awareness that, yeah, this was not necessarily the kind of unmediated response from a child that we would normally gather. But that's still really interesting that um, in this instance, her parents wanted to make her an artistic response to, to the invitation um, with her one year old. So, so yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, was, it was sort of a strange situation for us, wasn't it? Because we were dealing, dealing with a lot of material but there had been very much, there was very much a response mediated very, very much by the adult world. So can we skip to the next slide, please? So just so you can read this. And um, so this is by Phoebe, age two, and this is also from her, from her mum. Phoebe and her twin sister have enjoyed bug hunting in our garden. Phoebe loves painting and has learnt her colours recently. She has learnt how to paint a rainbow too. Phoebe painted her spiders unaided and combined her love of bugs, colours and rainbows together because Boris said. Um, and again, you know, Phoebe's spiders are brilliant. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and it's interesting as well that we started to get themes of um, si sibling relationships becoming much more significant during this period. Um, because families are locked down together, not just um, parents spending much more time engaged with their very young children, but actually siblings, um, siblings having that much more integral time to just be together and what comes out of that process. Can we skip to the next slide, please? Yeah, do you want to talk about Rufus, Sarah? Yes, um, I, I love, there were quite a few stories about Rufus and Monty and, and how their relationship was, was changing and developing because of spending so much time together. I'm a good leader, mummy, because Monty is the littlest one and I'm helping him learn to be a leader too. Um, and we had a series of, of, of images of Rufus and, and Monty together. Um, and I, I think it, it's, yeah, it's, it's thrown up that sense of responsibility, that sense of caring and awareness that we're in challenging times. And even if you're five, that you have a, have a duty of care to your little brother, which again is part and parcel of life at other times. Um, but I think became particularly pronounced during, during the strangeness of 2020. And then I think the final 
example response that we just wanted to share with you um, was Alexandra, um, who gave us lots of the images that were coming through from, from other children and children's responses. Uh, we had a number of paintings where germs were hiding in bushes, ready to jump out. I think the, the concept of germs um, uh, being, being there, being ready to get us at any point became a very, very potent one for lots of children. Um, that kind of that lovely positivity of being able to walk in the middle of the road because the cars have all stopped but this idea of, of hiding of us hiding away of the germs hiding from us um it became became really prevalent i think in a lot of the responses from from families and um, again a very eloquent response from a five-year-old uh, so clearly kind of mediated through the lens of the lens of a, of a, of a primary carer um, but this image of lions as well, we had a lot, my five-year-old became very fascinated by predators and prey um, during this process. I think the idea was partly the fault of David Attenborough and me trying to introduce it too soon, I think, but also very much, um, uh, I think, this, this feeling of being little and maybe on the edge and maybe weak one, or the fact that he was very aware that his grandparents were shielding and that, that idea that there was a predator. Um, so that, that was a theme that, that came through quite strongly as a, uh, an image in a number of different responses as well. Um, can we skip to the next slide, please? Um, so, so as I say, we, we felt quite, um, We've, we've, we felt quite unnerved, I think, by some of the responses in the initial call out because we thought we'd made a very open invitation for creative responses and it was clear that the material that we were getting back was um, was uh, very much mediated through through the adults in the children's lives, which was just an unusual experience given, given our previous experience of, of um, co-creation and mining of, of inspiration from, from children themselves. Um, but I think what we came to recognise as we worked through the process was that actually there was a, a really big response from from adults because they they want that there was a need there that actually the process was serving a function for the adults because they really wanted to kind of make a marker of, of what their children's experience was to make sure that they passed that on because they recognised that it was an experience an important experience in time. Um, yeah, and I think that was really interesting, wasn't it? That that yes, we had started with a desired outcome, and I don't mean in terms of what the responses were, but we were thinking we're going to try and find a way of engaging the children. The slight disappointment at that not being exactly as we had hoped, but actually the the unexpected positive of that engagement with, with parents who will be coming with their children to see the performances, um, who are such a hugely important part of their children's lives. You know, a child's perspective on the world is to such an extent dictated by their familial ex situation and familial experiences. Mm. Um, so it was mm -hmm. a, an unexpected insight into something that yeah. I think has, has given us a richness, even though, compensating of, on the other side of that is less direct engagement with the children. Absolutely. So very, very much Hope, pros and cons, yeah. Hopefully something that we can engage further when we can meet each other in the real where the, where the process has real authenticity, I think. But I think as a learning point for me, it's been very much about how the show needs to serve um, both uh, child and um, parent carer in a way that we wouldn't usually deliberately go to do that. So there's an urgency about making this work, I think, because it, it needs to be an artistic response that still has meaning and reflects back people's experiences, but probably more deliberately than we would do in our usual work, making sure that it, that it reaches um, parent carers as well as, as, as the children uh, in terms of, of, of the artistic response to the material. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and also perhaps in our practice as well, recognizing that um, that engaging with uh, children um, in co-creation and mining of ideas um, is in, in nursery settings outside their parent carer relationships, it gives you a different kind of material, doesn't it? And actually maybe there is some value as well in engaging, engaging with children um, in those relationships too, as part of our processes going forward. 
we were talking yesterday about Luna and Theatre Yellow for many years pretty much exclusively to two schools and because we were going into all the state nurseries in Cardiff and the Vale of Glamorgan the demographic that we were reaching was really broad um, and then sometimes when we went into theatres it was slightly narrower um, and at one point Point, the Arts Council of Wales, in its infinite wisdom, um, decided that it was more important for children to experience theatre in a theatre setting than in their educational setting. And there was a real volt fast, a real turnaround in, in policy. And I can remember being really upset about what the ramifications of that might be in terms of, of the reach of the work. And um, we then did a performance of Luna in a folk museum in, in Cardiff, which I think today has featured in Vogue magazine, which is <laughs> quite incredible. Um, and because of the need for so many more parent helpers, we were suddenly seeing parents from a very different demographic um, from the parents we normally encountered that we had been performing to those children from the Somali community, the Bangladeshi community, um, the very kind of working class white docks community here in Cardiff for many, many years, but we hadn't been engaging particularly with their parents. And that was a really interesting point in the company's development of, of thinking, yeah, that those, those parents haven't experienced this work with their children, because on the whole, their children have been coming to see the work or have been seeing the work in school time with their teachers and their teaching assistants. Um, and I think that would be a, another real challenge is to, to look at how, how we can engage with a broader demographic when we are engaging with parents um, and families, yeah. Absolutely. So the final invitation, um, which came uh, towards the end of this gather, um, information gathering, was a, a set of questions which we asked children who were four and five years old mainly, um, and, and they gave us their responses, again much more direct in order to be able to map some of the images. And it was interesting that there were many fewer responses to the direct question rather than the open invitation. Um, and, and that might be because it was later on in the lockdown period and, and people were freer, children were about to go back to school, that kind of thing. Um, or it might be just that, um, that that initial need to communicate creatively what was happening um, in the emotional lives of their families was sort of met in, in that first invitation. Um, so yes, the, um, the project uh, When the Birds Sang all of this lovely material and more material which we are continuing to gather from children as we move through the process um, will become a, a, an astonishing response, artistic response, I think, which Sarah is going to lead, um, which will be presented at the Hollow Blue um, next year, um, hopefully as a, as a really big thank you to all of those families that took the time to, to tell us about this extraordinary time in the lives of their, theirs and them and their children. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. I um, I have so many questions. Um, I found that really interesting, really inspiring. Um, uh, in terms of uh, questions from other people, though, I'll I'll hold off on mine if, uh, because obviously we'll uh, see if anybody else has any other of their own questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, we can do this in different ways. You, if you've got your camera on, you can just wave at me. Um, and I'll make a note of, of who would like to ask a question. Uh, you could put something into the chat box um, or you could do use the participant raise your hand button in the participant box as well, if that's um, helpful. Um, if we don't, we've got about sort of just over 10 minutes, I think, for questions. Um, if lots come up um, or if you think of anything towards the end that you haven't had a chance to ask, then please do stick it in the chat box and we can try and do it by email um, and, and do it like that instead. Um, is there any, anybody with a burning question to start with? Because I've got, I have a pile. <laughs> uh, um, okay, well, I'll start, which is like, one of the things that was really stood out for me in that particularly was, um, Sarah, when you were talking about the um, importance of gathering stories verbatim, and the, the impact that that has on the, the work that's created. Um, 
one of the things that's come out repeatedly throughout the sessions throughout this whole week at Imagine If has been trying to centralize um, the um, authentic voice of children and young people and, and, what, and what we are doing um, within our own organizations to be able to, to do that. And I absolutely loved the, um, the, the fact that, yes, it's like being inside the head of my three-year-old is it was just it's absolutely amazing but um, I wonder if you could just tell me a little bit more about what you think the the wider impact of gathering uh, and keep keeping things verbatim when we are talking to children and and because we will all be if we work with children and young people we are all in the practice of gathering evaluation and uh, the voice of children and young people but I think I would love to hear from you about what specifically, what else do we get if we don't just write it down and what are we missing when we're taking notes, talking to children and we're not using their exact words? Yeah. I think it's about, it's partly about validation. It, you know, the, the, the beauty of, and again, as I say, I, I was very privileged to be able to spend a lot of time with each child, um, but even the, in normal times, the, the proximity of an adult who is there, who is looking at you intently, who has a pen in their hand, and I'm, I'm a bit, bit naff that I only ever use fountain pens, um, but that makes what, what is being written down really quite interesting. So that kind of intimate connection of a small person who is, has taken an object that they're not yet um, able to write, so that them understanding that they can look at this object, it can create images in their heads that makes words come out of their mouths, that makes this grown up person make a series of hieroglyphs on a page that then enables that grown up to read and re or to retell their story absolutely word for word as they said it. Um, and boy, if I ever, didn't get their story absolutely right, would they tell me? <laughs> you know, it be, I didn't know, no, it was this. Um, and I, I mean, I was attempting absolutely to record verbatim. Um, so I think that that sense of, of empowerment, of being listened to, of being looked at, of being respected, um, of then the stories would be typed up, would be illustrated, would be laminated and handed back, which meant there was this tangible record that the children were then able to share um, with their families. We were able to act them out at times. We did we did some work on acting out stories as a group. Um, and there was, there was one little boy I worked in, in one nursery setting where in the afternoon there were six boys, all of whom had some kind of speech difficulty. And one little boy had told me a number of stories over time. And there was one day I was starting to write his story and he grabbed my notebook and slowly turned it round and looked at me and then took my pen and looked at me again. And he said, you tell me a story. Oh. And I started telling a story and um, each time um, I stopped, he'd say, you got more story. And I tell him more story in the way that I'd engaged with him. And he was writing in kind of pre-emergent writing. Um, <laughs> and at the end, he told me back as much as he could remember of my story, because obviously he couldn't read it. Um, so I, I think it was about validation. It was about then giving adults who don't necessarily know how poetic, philosophical, um, insightful, um, emotionally intelligent children are an insight into that. Mm. Um, we did an intergenerational project last year, which I haven't referred to yet, um, but where um, members of a local old people's lunch club were working in the nursery. And one of the little boys had told a story about a soldier going to America and being shot. And the, the gentleman from the lunch club, as he read it, started, tears started to well up in his eyes because he wasn't aware that a four-year-old had that degree of emotional intelligence. Um, 
Thank Wind you. me up and I could go on for hours about this. I should let another question come in. Sorry. Um, please do just wave at me if if anybody has has a, has a question. Um, um, the other thing that I was going to. Um, so did Darren, have your hand up. Oh, sorry. Did I miss one? I give me a wave again if that was a question. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, my other question, I think, was going to be to, to Miranda and Sarah both, which was about the use of physical space and indoors versus outdoors and the differences in, in that, particularly because that's a um, something that everybody has been encountering big changes in. Um, over the last year and how we feel in our physical spaces when we're indoors, how we feel in our physical spaces when we're outdoors, um, and this kind of changing relationship with, with the outside. Um, uh, particularly another thing that I'd, that I'd found out as well that had happened during lockdown, which was about the changes in kind of right to roam and our uh, relationship with the natural world and the physical space in the natural world. So I think my, my question, I'm really interested in our changing relationship in, with the physical outside world. And um, particularly when you said that the, the work that um, had been linked with forest school as well, and whether um, what you think the, the impact of working in, uh, in, in outside spaces um, what impact does that have compared to uh, working indoors? Do you, do you want to talk about your forest project, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there was something, in, I think <laughs> there was a moment where um, Sheena, who we worked with from the Forestry Commission, was aware that children might be really disappointed next time they came back to the forest because it wasn't going to have giant pencils hanging in it or um, dragon's eggs under trees. And she said, you, you might have scuppered <laughs> children's enjoyment of the of forest. We hope not. That, that certainly wasn't our intention. Um, I think in terms of the the quality of the stories they 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 were writing about something they had lived in when they were telling us stories about having been in in the forest whereas when they were writing or not writing, telling us stories about a suitcase of objects their relationship to that object was much more tenuous is possibly too negative a word but but was less internalized less experiential so there was something gorgeous about them telling us what had happened to them when they had been in the woods, when they had physically been running around, picking up stones and pine cones and dropping them into a, a cooking pot that was over a, a, a live fire. Because we had a fantastic advisory teacher who was very, very much about um, risk management, not risk aversion. So the children were wading in ponds and going near to fire and I suppose in the spirit of, of forest schools. Um, nowadays, and, and it was interesting that a lot of the stories the children told, and maybe because we said when the birds sang, was about the outdoors. We did talk, didn't we, at one point about might we give them a, an impulse or a, a, an inspiration that was about the birds looking in at us or the the cats outdoors looking in at us and wondering why we were going out so much less during that period of time. What were we up to indoors when we all seemed to be sitting in front of these strange screen things? Um, and then decided that was possibly imposing too much of, on, on them and not in the spirit of drawing out and gathering their own responses to the situation. But I think, yeah, you're right. There's the, the whole relationship between indoors and outdoors has, has changed. Um, we it, recently managed in a window of opportunity to do a show for babies in Cardiff that was outdoors. And it was the first time we'd ever performed baby theatre outdoors because we were quite anxious about the ambient noise, the passers-by, the planes overhead, um, the wind, the weather. Um, but it, it's it's thrown up some really fascinating things about theatre for babies in in outdoor settings. 
I think there's something really to be said about meeting children in a neutral space as well. And that's a luxury that, that we often don't have. So I do most of my work in nursery settings. Um, but you're, you're then you're entering their space as a guest, don't you? Which changes the dynamic of the way that they might share. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so, and again, we're lucky that we've got a couple of really fantastic nurseries in Darlington that have great outdoor space. So actually you find that you get the most interesting free play, certainly in outdoor spaces, because um, it's just much more space to be, isn't there? Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting actually. And I don't know whether it was just the seasons um, and the fact that our only freedoms were going outside, but yeah, the number of responses that we got about, um, you know, the child that wanted to visit the ducklings every day and to see them grow and to count them and um, report back to us about uh, about you know how they were growing and developing and becoming becoming big fluffy ugly ducks as you call them and um, it it was yeah the the consciousness of the outdoors um, was very much a theme and will be very much a theme in, in the piece of work that we make I think it'd be really interesting to sort of I can't wait to see that it's going to be it sounds like it's going to be amazing um, we've probably got time for one more question if anybody has got anything that they'd like to ask. Um, if they haven't, I've got one one final one, which, oh, yes, Michael. Hi, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Michael Corley. I work for the North Canard Festival. Um, well, Susie on the bridge programme, but uh, for East Anglia. So thank you for inviting me up into the Northeast today. It's, really, it's been a really, really interesting, insightful conversation. Thank you all. I'm really interested in this, this idea around um, how we encourage child-led creativity within the home. Uh, and I wonder if I do have any reflections on where that might have happened. It's, it's quite interesting you talked about the mediation of parents, the kind of sense that there's a, a need to create the rainbow <laughs> picture uh, as a starting point for, for the creative engagement of children. And as a parent of a three-year-old and a five-year-old, I know I've been doing a lot of that over this period because it's good to put in the window, right? So um, I just wonder if you've got any successes and tips about how we might encourage that child-led uh, practice in the home and, and help parents to, to get over that thing of having a perfect rainbow. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. I think it comes back to a cultural fear of art and what art is and what people expect. And um, you know, when you ask people for an artistic response and the way that people held on to rainbows, um, you know, as, as this is the artistic response that we're going to make as a nation, <laughs> regardless of whether we're two or one, even in the case of Margot or, or 91, this is what we're going to do. And I think it's very hard when you make that invitation. And I'm always incredibly um, humbled by the fact that the parents want to make a creative response but I do think it does shine quite a light, a light on the fact that we are very anxious about art as a concept aren't we and and also about the freedom of childhood because actually Margot probably would have had a brilliant a much better time if she'd just been allowed to go wild in the paints and um, for us it's very much about uh in, embedding the idea of of just following your child in their play um, and so right at the heart of the hullabaloo we have a creative play installation space which is free for people to play in whenever we're open and um, we have a hugely diverse range of families that come there to play and our hullabaloo hosts are there to model play model positive play practice but it's essentially it's about following the child and the spaces are designed for that and people are empowered and encouraged to do that but yeah in the home is is really is really challenging i think because of those cultural issues that we have about art and and yeah and wanting everything to be nice and neat in a very British way I think <laughs> if you've got any ideas there. I, 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 years ago a, a friend and colleague introduced me to an exercise that I've worked done repeatedly with actors when we're making work for, for small children of one is in role as a child and one is in role as an adult and the child begins playing with some objects and then the parent is invited to to just watch and observe and, and support the play. And it is incredible how often the adult will start going, shall we put that over there? Um, and um, why, why don't you do this and put those in a pile there? And you can see the, the person in role as the child going, just let me play how I want to play. <laughs> um, there was even the the the, the um, adult who said, "Shall I show you how to do it properly?" And we all kind of grimaced. Um, but I think, yeah, it's it's very difficult. I, I 
I know that I hear myself playing with nieces and nephews and um, great nephews and falling into that trap. So I don't know whether, coming back directly to your question, Michael, that there is some kind of guidance to give to parents, but it's really tricky, isn't it, getting that balance that doesn't sound in any sort of way patronising or condescending or will teach you how to be good good or better parents in your engagement creatively with your children. Um, I think it's, it's a, a tricky balance. 